The Talk Station is proud to present The War Files. The War Files, a selection of interviews honoring our warriors of the greatest generation, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Claude Wheatley, if you will, tell me a little something about you. Where are you from? I'm from Beaufort. I had finished law school in uh, June of 41 and passed the bar in August. I came home when I was working in my father's law office. And uh, the war started December the 7th. I was trying a case in uh, Fayetteville in January of 42. When I finished that case, I decided I'd better find out what I was going to do during this war. And uh, being just 23 years old at the time, I was real interested in a unit that was going to be active. I had had a potential offer for the JAG Corps, that's the legal corps of the Navy, which I did not want. Anyway, so I enlisted in the field artillery, regular army, in January of 1942. Where did you enlist? Fort Bragg. I was a private, but I enlisted. And I went back, I had two weeks before I had to report for duty. But when I reported for duty, they found I'd been at the Citadel a couple of years and figured I knew something about close order drill. So I became an immediate sergeant and started drilling troops in the reception center. I didn't know, I'd left the Citadel in 37, where they had squad drill. They changed that now to close order drill. So I had to uh, read the book before I could trade troops, which I did. Well, I did that for about a week. Then I went up in the mountain to be transferred to a field artillery unit. I was sent over to 2nd Regiment. Then I took the examination of OCS, which I passed. And I was sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, for OCS, which is officer's training school in field artillery. And uh, there I stayed until September, late September, about maybe the 1st of October. I was commissioned as the second lieutenant, and they were building a new division at Camp Butler, North Carolina, 78th Infantry Division, where I was sent. And I was in a battalion of artillery, uh, light, light artillery, which is the 105 howitzer. I became the uh, executive officer of a firing battery, and we started training troops. We trained our first troops. We think we were ready for combat. The war was going on in North Africa. And they took, they didn't take us as a unit, but they took all of my cannoneers that I had spent a couple of three months training, and they were taken as replacements for North Africa. We got another group, worked them over. No foot sooner had we finished getting them through training that they were taken from us, it also was replacements. It was after that we got the 19 and 18 year olds, which the draft had dropped to include, and they were something else to handle. Anyway, we trained them and they became our final people. We had to have a battery test called Battery Test 1. And Battery Test 1 consisted of you're moving in an area in the woods you've never been before. Your forward observer is maybe three or four miles up forward from you. And he gives the command fire mission. Then you've got to find a place to go off those woods in this wooded area uh, where you can shoot out of. Go in position, fire the guns, hit that target, which of course you don't see, and uh, have your wire connection, telephone wire connection with the observer, all in 18 minutes. And it was a very hard test. And I asked my boys, these 18, 19 now who just got in, and uh, if they didn't want to be the best battery in the division, well, they did. 
And every night or after supper, after retreat, they change uniforms and we went in the woods and we practiced, and we practiced, and we practiced. But the day came for it. We took the test and uh, we finished. We hit the targets, I think it was on the second rounds, we hit the targets with all four guns. We stopped, but General Simpson, who commanded Second Army at that time, which was the local army in the States. Later he became the commander of Sixth Army in Europe. But General Simpson was an ex-artilleryman, and he was present when we were taking that test. And he came running out to me after it was over. Congratulations. And I learned then we did it in 11 minutes, which was the record for the Corps. Those boys became proud of what they did. They became the great soldiers at that moment, 18, the 19, the 20s. That battery stayed. I later commanded that battery. And uh, then I later became S2 of the battalion. And well, S2 is really intelligence, but S2 is also an assistant executive of the battalion. It helps the colonel, the commanding officer, with doing things that he has to have done. And that later became my job. We'll be winning combat. And uh, I had to go to school up at Camp David, which is our, our core school, to learn something about general maps and aerial photography and things of that nature, which I did. And we went overseas. And uh, how did you get overseas? Well, we were a troop ship. The ship that we all went on was a British auxiliary cruiser. Took our combat team. Our combat team was the three tenth infantry regiment. We attached to it, and we went over on that. We what landed at Southampton. We, <laughs> while going over, I was, my, my quarters were on the boat deck in the cabins. This old battery of mine was down on the sixth deck. Tommy would know something about that because he knows about troop carriers. It's the sixth deck down. It was horrible. I went down and found the old first sergeant seasick, about to die. I took him up to my, put him in my cabin. But we were about two days out to the convoy, and uh, our ship broke down. And we were by ourselves. They gave us a what they call a DE that was our protecting from the Jap subs. Or I understand were filling the Atlantic. I knew there wouldn't be, but a destroyer escort. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a little ship. I knew that uh, we were going to be tor torpedoed. So uh, I went down, got that old bay. It wasn't my battery anymore, but I still thought of it as mine. And I took it up to that boat deck. And then we had a lot of rafts on top of the deck there. There, I told the boys to get on the raft. I said, everybody put on life jackets. I had them that way. I said, we we get hit, and we'll try to stay together. Stay on the rafts, don't worry about the boats. We stayed there for 10 hours. Well, luckily, we weren't hit. They fixed the, the, the ship, and we uh, took off and caught the convoy. When we landed at Southampton, I'm watching, they were bombing Southampton, the Germans were, with the with, uh, buzz bombs. I'm, I'm standing on the deck watching it with my binoculars. You know, feel somebody punch me in the back. He was the first sergeant. Why don't we go in? I said, they're blowing the port up. The hell with that. I'd rather be there than on this, on this <laughs> boat. Let's, well, anyway, the poor fella, we finally landed. And uh, we went in the, this place where we stayed, the whole division, this town. What year, what, what time of year and what year? This would have been about September of 44. This division had been trained to break the Siegfried line. We were supposed to be the major division that was going to break into <clears throat> Germany. We, uh, the Army worked that way. You had your divisions for D-Day, you had your divisions for different things. And our division was set forth to take care of the Siegfried line. And we practiced on it. We thought we knew what the Siegfried line looked like. We had drilled on it for a year. We got ready to go ashore across the channel. My job was to load the battalion. Well, I went to each of the batteries, 
to at least the battery commanders what we were going to do, how they were going to do it, what they had to do. As I was leaving my old battery, I was talking to the battery commanders that time with J.D. Johnson, a close friend of mine. As I had talked with him, the door was open. First sergeant heard everything we <clears throat> was talking about. And as I went out, he asked me, he said, how long is it going to take us to drive to, to France? I said, Sergeant, we're going to go aboard an LST at uh, Plymouth. He said, what's an LST? I said, that's a small ship, about 250 feet long. You mean we going on another boat? So I'm not going. What did he say? <laughs> we got to the port. We had these three other SSTs, and as we load one, it'd go off out in the harbor and anchor. And same thing, well, we finished loading, and the third one pulled out. Well, I went up to get final orders to carry it back to the battalion. Then I went down on the dock. It was about, I had been, I had had a good night's rest in three days. And uh, as I got on the dock, I saw one of the shore boats were running around, and I waved it to come in and pick me up, and he did. And I jumped down, and it, it was just he and I in the boat. And I had a musette bag with my name, Wheatley was Stetson on it. And as we were moving out towards the boat, I'm sitting back there sort of dozing. He asked me, he said, are you Claude Wheatley from Beaufort? I said, yes. I said, who are you? He said, I'm Joe Rose from Harkins Island. He was in the Coast, Coast Guard. And uh, the Coast Guard had been taken into the Navy, you know, and they were using these boys to run these shore boats. By the time we got to the LST, as about all I'd said, I didn't get much more from him. They kept us at sea for about six days to be well ashore. We landed in a little town, wound up in a little French town named Ivato. There were the two of the LSTs went up someplace. We went and landed another place. The Navy making his usual file ups. We landed about half the battalion, which I had to take over. Finally got it in order. And we went down the road. And we next day we met our battalion, got reorganized, and we went up into France. It was there so later, I got orders to uh, organize a reconnaissance group of about 50 jeeps. We left at 11 o'clock that night, going east. Now, the, the, the company uh, was, had gone south. My orders were to go east, find the Germans if they were any moving. But we did. I got lost in uh, Louvre, France, which is a big sized town. My map didn't show any roads or streets, it just showed a big black dot. And I, I got in the middle of the town, the road's curving this way and that way, and I had, here I am leading 50 jeeps approximately, four or five soldiers in a jeep, lost. If I was in a mess, and I saw a black, blackout curtain flash. I stopped the column, I walked over to this blackout curtain, opened the door, it was a bar, and then it were about 30 Belgian men, they called them Belgiques. They thought we were Germans, that's why they were so quiet. When they found we were Americans, boy, did they jump up. I got a couple of kisses from these fellas on both cheeks. No, they were glad to see us. Have a drink, which I did. We all, these two soldiers I had with me, we got, I sent them back out, and I brought in every soldiers in that column, got in shifts. Well, finally, after I'd wasted about 30 minutes, which I'd have probably been court martialed for if they knew I'd done it. I uh, got one of the fellas to show me how to get out of town. So he went with us, threw his bicycle across the hood of the Jeep and <clears throat> led me out of town. Well, we wound up the next day in a Belgium town about 10 miles from the German border. I radioed back, how far you want me to go? Stop for Lord's sakes, don't go any further. Without <laughs> borders. <clears throat> Well, these people in this little town is named Holson. I was told we were going to pitch tents. They came out, this priest came out with this uh, Belgian girl who could speak English. They invited us to stay in their homes, and those people in that town took us all in their homes and we, as their guests. And we, and we were their guests for at least two weeks before the division came up. We will return to the war files in just a moment. To hear a web exclusive featuring portions of this interview not broadcast on this program, visit the Viewpoints webpage at thetalkstation.com. 
We now return to The War Files, featuring a War Files interview with Claude Wheatley. My, my, my command was Lazar officers. We had three captains that were assigned to each of the three battalions. Well, not only that, I, I was also responsible for our aerial. We had two Piper Cubs. And I was also responsible for survey. We had a survey section, but we had a survey officer. And also my job was uh, reconnaissance. Well, the uh, liaison officer for the 3rd Battalion to the 310th failed. He'd somehow to him, fell out. I had nobody replacing him, so I took his place on the 14th of uh, December of 44. We then got ready to go to Germany. And uh, we attacked, we moved into Germany about a mile and a half, and we got orders to stop. We went on in this town, and we got orders to stop. I didn't know why, but I figured I'd organize my part of it by the book. So I think I had five observation <clears throat> posts with Liz, with Ford observers. So we got them all dug in. We ran telephone wire to each, had a switchboard back under this place I'd set up for my for myself, which I got under a house and dug a hole. And that's where I put everything. And that's also where the infantry battalion commander came and joined the state. That was his headquarters. Well, we were getting a lot of getting some fireworks coming in on us. Not too bad. On the fifteenth we really dug in and got that town really tight. On the morning of the 16th, about 5 o'clock, phone rang, and we got orders that the Germans were attacking. And it was quite a heavy attack, and our orders were to hold that ground to the last man. The same command went to the uh, infantry. Well, the, so we got ready. Daylight on about 7 o'clock, the German attack came. This is the beginning of the Bugs battle. And... Uh, we didn't know at that time, but fortunately, we were dug in so well, and so was the infantry, that they couldn't bother us. We knocked them down, the first Germans. We were able to bring our artillery fire using, and we used a lot of time fire on them, which was explosions about 40 yards up, off the ground, which raised down the steel on, on this attacking infantry, which was very effective. And so we were able to hold them off. We didn't lose an inch of ground. Tanks, the German tanks went around us. We didn't stop them. Our shells bounced off of those Tigers and uh, that's because they had nine inches of armor on their front and our 105s would penetrate. With the infantry, we stopped. Now, that battle ran for, we were out of our ammo on the 18th, but we were able to hold it. No problem. We got him. We got the ammo back on the 19th, and uh, the, the Germans attacked us again on the 20th. They figured we were out of ammo. I think that's why they did it. But we, but we surprised them. We were able to stop them. And uh, <clears throat> that Bulls battle ran for two and a half, about maybe three weeks. The Germans lost over 250,000 men in that battle. Run up. They they lost all of their armor because the armor ran out of fuel. Tried to get back into uh, Germany, and we shot them as they came back. We knocked them out. A lot of their tanks were abandoned. The crew walking back, trying to get back into Germany. It, that battle really made the rest of the war much easier for us because the Germans did not have any armor. We, so after that, if we had an attack, we had to go and, and take the town of Schmidt, which was on the top of a hill, uh, which, which this, this town, as I remember it, was the main town for the Samuel Dam, which was the big lake. It was back down at the Ruhr River, and the Germans could have opened any time and washed us away if we'd been down that area, but we managed we had one battalion of infantry of the 101st Airborne joined us. But this town was the same town that the 28th Division had tried to take back in November. And they had attacked up right up this side of this hill and were met by the thunderous defense of the Germans. 
and they lost around 4,000 men. Their, their bodies were still out there on that slope covered with snow. Hmm. I knew that my old friend Preston Mason from Beaufort was a sergeant in that unit. And we did not know what had ever happened to him in the reports. We knew he was missing. And I went around after we'd taken the town, we'd finished it. And I told the, the uh, burial officer, if he found the sergeant, let me know. I, I said, don't bury him, hold him. I don't know what I was going to do with him, but some reason I didn't want him to take him off. I wouldn't be there. But uh, I left a soldier there to come back because I had to get back to take care of my job. And he, he came back late that day and said they'd finished and they did find that soldier, that sergeant. So then I knew that he was probably a prisoner, and sure enough, he was. What was it like in the weather? I mean, it was cold. It was freezing, snow, knee deep, in a lot of places. It was it was very cold. Uh, but yet, these men, they were soldiers. They were great. These men, I'm telling you, it was the greatest organization. And the officers of this battalion were the finest men you could find. They they were they were really fighters. One time we were moving up in a minefield and the mines were everywhere. Well, we had a platoon of engineers that were sweeping and I wasn't moving the batteries till they swept the battery positions clean. We were out of the edge, the Germans, we had knocked them back and it was not what you call a very easy thing to do, but this, this, this group of Marines were doing the right, I mean, the engineers were doing a great job. Well, I was going to move the batteries A, B, and C and I was sweeping A first. I had one, but he commanded the B battery when we moved. He'd come to me, let me go first, let me go first, let me go first. He wanted me to always be the first. When he came to me, he said, I'll sweep my own. I said, you suit yourself. His name was Ted Wardlow. I said, all right, Ted, you suit yourself. I didn't really know what he meant by his sweep zone. But he got in his Jeep, he went over his area, Got his soldiers out of the Jeep by himself, he was driving it. And he drove that Jeep around that minefield. If he hit a mine, he'd have been blown to pieces. But he ran that Jeep around that area, came back to me, said, I'm ready. I said, move. So he was first battery again. Well, anyway, that was Wardlow. He was a strict hard on his troops if they didn't obey him on everything, but they moved and they did great. Anyway, when the war was over, and we went occupation duties, Wardlow had to, had, he occupied three German towns. We were in Hiss, and uh, I had, I'd gone back to occupation duty myself. So I commanded the battery, I had three towns. But something was going wrong at his, and I was sent over to uh, see what was wrong over at his that section. And I found that he stayed drunk all the time. Hmm. And I asked his first sergeant, I found him in the bed, I asked the first sergeant of his, of his battery, I said, what's happened to him? He said, well, he's trading gasoline to the French for cognac. And I went up to his bedroom and the floor was covered with bottles. I called the battalion surgeon up, who was a fine young man, had some psychiatric training. What could we do? He said, well, what we've got here, he never touched a drop combat. You never heard of him doing anything like that. He said combat was his soul fill of his body, was combat. He loved it. He wanted it. He did it. He said, now there's no combat, he's empty. The only thing he can fill that body with now is cognac. He said, I said, well, you work on him. Well, we tried to get him sober. We never did. That fight should have come back to this country a hero. Right. And recognized when he came back just a drop. We will return to the War Files in just a moment. To hear a web exclusive featuring portions of this interview not broadcast on this program, visit the Viewpoints webpage at thetalkstation.com.
We now return to The War Files, featuring a War Files interview with Claude Wheatley. Well, there's another story I want to tell you. But when I came back, my daddy had been teaching the Sunday school class for about 30 years at St. Paul's Church. Of course, I wasn't much of a Bible student, but he was dying in, in uh, August of uh, 47. And he asked me to do certain things for him. And one of the things he asked me, he said, look after our church. Well, I, I didn't know exactly what he meant. Anyway, after he was buried, our rector came to see me. He said, I want you to take over your father's Sunday school class. I said, I can't do that. I couldn't even have to open the Bible. I said, well, you can learn. <laughs> well, anyway, I took over the class based upon my promise, do the best I could. And the first day, which was in September of 47, first class, I remember something was in the lesson relating to faith, faith, Christian faith. After I finished the lesson the best I could, I got a question from one of the members of the class asking me to give an example of what I thought was Christian faith. I said, well, I don't know what the Bible would say, but I'll tell you a war story. During the Bulls battle, I said, our combat team was having trouble. There was a ridge out in front of us in which the Germans were shooting downhill. And uh, the commander of one of the battalions, infantry, called me in. I wanted to know if I'd help him figure out some way we could attack that hill. So we talked about it. We figured the certain targets that had to be met, certain things we'd have to do. And one of it was, any time you ever took a piece of land from the Germans, they'd always counterattack. If they didn't have but a squad, they'd counterattack. So I knew that this counterattack would be heavy, so I agreed to go with him and take up five, I believe I did, four observer teams. And we decided what well, would be a good day to do that. So we decided we'd do it Christmas morning. Those Germans, we figured, would have a big Christmas Eve party. We might catch them asleep. That was our plan. There's also, if you remember, the day that Washington crossed the Delaware and attacked the Hessians in Trenton. He caught them asleep. I said, let's try it. So Christmas Eve, we were getting ready. I was getting my crowd ready, had them all lined up and so forth. And up showed a chaplain for Christmas Eve service. He was a Catholic priest. His name was Lucas. He was a Jesuit priest, one of the tops. He was a top-notch chaplain, too. Anyway, he came in. He was having Christmas Eve mass with his faithful, and he came by to see me. He had a cantina of cognac on him, and we took a slug at that. And he said he'd heard about this attack we'd planned for Christmas Day. He, we talked about it. I said, by the way, Lucas, you can't go with us. Because he would do that. He was a he was a combat chaplain. He said, "Okay, I will go." Well, the next morning, we took off a four day. I was pretty close to the front of the unit, and we had out two scouts as we were moving up on the attack. And they hit a mine field, and both of those boys went down. Well, we turned and went around them to go towards the target area, and I saw somebody crossing that mine field, walking right across it, just like it was a sidewalk. And I knew it wasn't our medics. Then it dawned on me, it was Lucas. Despite what I told him, he is still at the rear of the column. He, he had moved on up. Well, we went on, got the ridge, took the uh, area. There was the counterattack. Our units were there. And they stopped it with our artillery. We held it. And I looked, I was in the back area of the place. And there was a house. And I said, we might be able to use this house for some type of headquarters. <clears throat> and while I walk into this room, the back door opens. And in comes Lucas. I flushed at him. I said, I told you not to join us. And he looked at me. He said, I want you to know something. I'm not in your army. I'm in God's army. I don't take orders from you. I take orders from God. God sent me to do my duty. And I tried to do it. He said, if I'd been killed, he said, the doors of eternal life would have opened immediately. He said, I wouldn't have been in purgatory that long. And he snapped his fingers. He said, now you pagans don't understand that. 
Well, from that time on, Luke and I were close friends. I said, that's my example of Christian faith. That was a uh, retired bishop in my class that morning. Bishop. He just had me in Beaufort. He came up to me after the class and said, that's a great story. He said, can I borrow it? I've got a sermon to preach next week. I said, yes, sir. If you want it, you take it. Well, the buzz went on for another week or so. When that was over, we moved out and started moving through Germany. We go ahead and have to take stroke. We, we had to do that. That's, we had to take the area of the Spaniel Dam. We had several little battles all in there. I can't remember all of them. But uh, the Rhine became our next big deal. How, how could we cross that Rhine? We knew that crossing the Rhine was going to be one of the biggest efforts of the war. The Germans were probably probably to use that as their greatest defense. The ride at that time was running maybe 10 knots, so snow was melting on the Alps, filling the ride, it was just flowing. The ride flowed out towards the, uh, towards the Balkan Sea. In other words, that was one of those rivers where the ride, instead of flowing inward from the ocean, flows outward, which made it a very difficult river to cross because of the current. Mm -hmm. I got orders to, to move on down towards that area with my reconnaissance unit. We weren't supposed to have to worry about the Rhine. There was no bridges supposed to cross the Rhine, so our, so our air had said. Patton's army, which was the third army, was about 80 miles really south of us. He was supposed to have a big crossing. And we were just supposed to go on the Rhine and kind of hold that area, whatever, if we could. Our combat team was divided. There were two roads that led east towards the Rhine. We were, I was on one of them, and the one to, right to the south of me was occupied by the 7th Armored Division. Anyway, we had a battalion of empty riding those tanks in our combat team. We had, a, I think I had three Jeeps, machine gun mounts, but we were moving down towards the Rhine area. I came to a deep chasm, and I looked at my map, and right down to the bottom of this chasm sat the town of Arweiler. Well, the Our River, that's where he got his name, the Our River started somewhere in that area and flowed towards the Rhine eastwardly. Arweiler was a town, sort of a recreational town, summer town, we call it for the Germans. It was there. This chasm was made three or four hundred feet deep. That's how much river, sort of like the Grand Canyon, only smaller. I looked at it, I first decided, I thought I'd just pass it, but I said, no, I better not. So I went down that road, it was, till I got down to the bottom of it. And at the end, I saw this hotel. I went to this hotel, opened the door, and in it, it was filled with our soldiers that had been captured. They were all wounded, of course. And were, all of them were orthopedic wounded, broken legs and thighs and arms. The Germans, and their nurses had all left them. There weren't any Germans, no troops, nothing there. I went and talked to these boys, and some of them could walk, some of them couldn't. Well, I couldn't radio back because I'm down in that hole. My radio wouldn't work, so I had to send a radio up on the ridge. It radioed back that I had found a bunch of our, our people. There was air. There were some of our infantry was in there. There was one soldier in my, from my unit that had been captured, he was not a foreign observer. Anyway, they came and picked him up. And when our doctors saw these people, some of them could walk around with that had, had broken femurs. They found that the Germans, with their open reduction of surgery and their intermodellar rods, that was something brand new for our orthopedics. And they took them all back and uh, X-rayed them and found this new procedure, which we're using today. The College of Orthopedics adopted that. I told the orthopedic doctors that uh, I ought to be a member of their orthopedic college. I found it. <laughs> anyway, they came and got those boys. We kept on going. We're down, we were about a mile from the Rhine, and we came to this large farm, and I pulled in. Boy scouters searching around, see if there were any German troops around it. Then there weren't. 
they found some eggs and ham though, brought back the old lady in the farmhouse to do that cooking for them. I saw a bathtub and I better take a much needed bath. I haven't had one several months. But that time my boy left on the radio, came running in, said, Colonel Lutz radioed me directly. He knew about where I was. He said, there's a bridge across the ride. We need to tend to it. Well, I jumped out the tub best I could, got my clothes on, and we took for the ride, and sure enough, saw the bridge at Ramagat. And they didn't know that the bridge we was there? We did not know it was there. And nobody knew it. We found the bridge. I was about a mile north of the bridge when I came out. Lutz, who called me on the radio, was at the bridge. They hadn't taken Ramagat at that time. But I transferred to a battery commander, to Johnson, I believe it was. Uh, there's a bridge across the ride. Y'all come on. Don't worry about the colonel. Come on. Oh, and here they came. That was the kind of battery we have. And they came there. We were the first artillery guns. But they came. I mean, that, they were the greatest outfit. You, I mean, they were trained. They were gung-ho people. There was another person I want to talk about. And his name, Sterling Nicholson. Sterling was an observer on one of the Pipers. Now, he was... I believe the 309th Italian. Anyway, he was there. And he, when he heard about that ride crossing, he came. Now, we, those planes weren't supposed to be flown over, over the lines. They were very fragile, built like kites, pilot and observers, what you had on them. But they were there for observation, target fighting, things like that. Well, he came across that river and tried to spot some of the guns, German guns, and directed fire from other artillery units that were in place. That was very effective. And he did that <clears throat> for the next week. He was shot down. Shell went through his plane, took off his leg, part of his hand. Somehow he got out of that plane on a parachute. It was about 2,000 feet up. He was left for dead in front of this German town. The pilot was captured by the Germans. and uh, But a doctor of that little town that he was in front of and a minister of the Lutheran Church, I believe it was. Went out and got him, stopped <clears> his bleeding, <throat> patched him up the best they could. And we found him the next day, got him back. He now lives at Moorhead. He did a great job. He was a great hero, a silver star, etc. He's well decorated. And he lived. Of course, he's still walking around with that iron leg, leg now. But anyway, I, I had to mention, that's part of the crossing of the ride. When we got there, I had tried to, to go up the steeple of a church to see across the ride. But uh, on the far side of the ride, you have a lot of hills that block any type of sight. You can't see across the ride. So when that battalion got there, the first thing I asked for from these batteries was observers to cross the ride because I had found some trucks that floated, they called them ducks, and uh, there were people there with them had come up to the ride. And I conquered two or three of them, and we uh, put set six observers, six boys across the ride. They went across, and they were anxious to go, even though there was nobody over there. They wanted to be the first American feet to hit the far side, and they were. They went there and crawled up those hills with those radios and started finding targets. And we started bringing fire on those targets because we couldn't see the targets from the guns. They had to direct the fire from these positions. And one of those observers, his name was John Atten, he was a lieutenant, and he spotted the counterattack that was being formed. And we brought fire on that thing, brought it down and stopped that counterattack. And that probably made the conquering of Ramagan Bridge possible. And our people crossed the bridge I crossed it later, after we moved it up, and uh, that took Ravaga. We will return to the War Files in just a moment. To hear a web exclusive featuring portions of this interview not broadcast on this program, visit the Viewpoints webpage at thetalkstation.com. We now return to the War Files, featuring a War Files interview with Claude Wheatley. To hear a web exclusive featuring portions of this interview not broadcast on this program, visit the Viewpoints webpage at thetalkstation.com. When you found the Remagen Bridge, 
when the USAU, when they found the Remagen Bridge. Did that surprise everyone in command? Oh, yes. In fact, is our division, the whole division crossed the next day. And General Bradley, who commanded 12th Army Group, came up there. And then General commanded 1st Army, he also showed up. And he, he directed these uh, other divisions across. Meantime, we kind of we started the pontoon bridge because we were afraid of this bridge. There had been some explosions on the Romagna that made it weak. We were afraid to send armor across it. And uh, they were building a pontoon bridge right to the south of it, which was later built. And uh, that's where the 3rd Armor Division crossed the pontoon bridge, but General Rose, he said he was on his way to Berlin, but he was killed the next day. And then from Remagen, where did you go? Well, for there, <clears throat> they had what was, we went up on a river that ran down into the Rhine, and we held that for a day or so, and then there was a big wooded area. They called this the Ruhr Pocket. That was where the final hold on that part of Germany was ordered by, Ger by Hitler. And that was commanded by a German general. He had a large number of German troops there. Now, the, the, the German army was divided into two types of soldiers. You had your Wehrmacht, mm -hmm. that's your regular army. Then you had your SS units. They were those special trained units by Hitler that would do anything. The SS had taken orders to not to let any surrenders occur. And the Wehrmacht wanted to surrender, and we got orders to go through it. We had battle groups. I had one. We went through it. We'd gone in about, I guess, a couple hundred yards and saw German Wehrmacht officers that had been hugged from a tree by the SS. They tried to surrender to their troops, and they were hugged. Shortly after that, a bullet went through the windshield. I realized we had an observation, and uh, we found out that it was a pocket of SS troops, maybe 50 or 60 in it, but that was enough to keep the Wehrmacht under control. And they fired at us, so we had to stop that. And we had with us a young lieutenant that never been in combat in his life. His name was Lieutenant Cott. He was a Jewish boy. His family had escaped Hitler during the 30s, come to New York. He had gone to the army. He was relatively young. He could speak German, of course, and that's why we had him. He went up with a loud, with these megaphones, what do you call it? Mm -hmm. And they started talking to me in German, tell the war was practically over, time to surrender, why die, and so forth. And they fired back, indicating they weren't giving up. I said, well, I'm going to go back. Well, we had an artillery battery with us. We went down, got the guns, wrecked the ridge. I didn't want any of our infantry to go in there. I just hated to lose anybody as I knew that war was soon over. When I came back up, I found Cot dead. He had stood up to prove his good faith. That's what he thought he should do. And they machine gunned him. Well, we raked the ridge with artillery and our infantry went in, seeing what they'd done to Cot. And they didn't take any surrenders. They killed every one of them. Well, we did a pro about a thousand Wehrmacht around us surrendered, stood up. And we didn't even know they were there. Wow. And they went in. We took that day, I bet you there were 10,000 surrenders. We had no people to control them. We just marched them back, and they went back. They dropped their weapons and drove back. And that continued on through for about 10 days. And for us, the war was over. And I went, moved across the street where we were forming a place for our people to live. And while I was there, the soldier said, for me, and I found I had gotten, I had earned a UK leave, whatever that it was, I didn't know. And we were the guest of the British. And about an hour later, as soon as I could get a uniform, I left. Went to England. When I came back after the ten days, the war was over in Europe. I was in Belgium when the war, the declaration of peace was declared, and that ended my war. Something I've asked, I've asked everyone. 
you came home, you went back to work. Did you ever wonder during that period of time if anybody remembered or recognized the sacrifice and the challenges you faced in World War II? No, because there were so many of us. When we came back from the war, they, they were come back, the retired veterans were a many. I'll tell you something else, though. Don't talk about what an effect it had. I was, I was not been married maybe a year. And uh, Dr. Hyde, who was, you know, you remember Dr. Hyde, he was Alice's doctor. And he came to my office and sat down. And uh, we were talking, just as we're talking now. And finally, I said, Doc, why'd you come by and say before? He looked at me kind of funny. I tell me the truth. He said, well, Alice asked me to. I said, Alice did. I said, why? She said, well, it seemed like so many times at night you get up out of the bed and make her get up and say, come on. We've got a pillbox we've got to take or reconnaissance we've got to go. Come on. And you give her orders as if she was a soldier. And you tell her, she said, come on with the others. And you call other people that, of course, not there in the room. So let's go. And then after that, you go get back into bed. And said, you've done that several times. And she wants to know if you're crazy. And I had absolutely no memory of that. I didn't have any idea. So she wouldn't be. <laughs> Alice had never mentioned it to me. She never asked me about it. She never complained about it. Said that he told, she told Doc that she got out of bed and did what I told her to do. And she wouldn't get much sleep in those days. <laughs> but anyway, I did do that. But I didn't do it out of fear. I think I enjoyed the war. Mm -hmm. I really did. It was, it was a big adventure. It was exciting. You've been listening to The War Files, a selection of interviews honoring our warriors of the greatest generation, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. To hear a web exclusive featuring portions of this interview not broadcast on this program, visit the Viewpoints webpage at thetalkstation.com. The War Files is a talk station presentation. You had, had you been to the memorial before no. the honor flight? No. Why did it not, it took till 2000 to finally begin building a World War II memorial when we had already built the Korean memorial, the Vietnam memorial? Why did it take that long, do you think, to finally decide to build a memorial? Uh, to World War II? Well, World War II was a forgotten thing. It was old, it's been 65 years now. See, that was, I guess about 65, mm -hmm. stop thinking about 65. it. 65. And uh, it had been forgotten. The uh, Senator Dole, if you remember, was the moving force in right. that. And uh, we didn't need any memorial. I didn't. But memorial was in my mind. But I didn't need a memorial. I didn't care if they had one or not. The, the people I knew were forgetting World War II. They'd had the career, had Vietnam. We've got this mess we're in over here in the Mideast. And they haven't got time to remember it, things that they talk about things that they never knew about. You never knew about World War II. You weren't born till after World War II. Well, so most of the other people in the United States. Oh, I'm 92 years old. I was 23 when I went in. And so, and I was probably one of the oldest ones in the battalion. Mm. At 26. 25, 26. That was my combat age, 25, 26. See, we weren't, the combat in Europe didn't last all that long. D Day was in June. The Battle of the Bulge, I'm telling you about, was December. Ramaga was March of the next year. 
And after we hit hit Rabagan, that's when the war started to end. That's when it started to end. Because the Germans didn't, they were not the fighters after we crossed that bridge that they were before we crossed that bridge. When we crossed the Rhine, something went out of the German soldier. Hmm. And they surrendered in great heaps. I had, I, I had, I've had them stand up out of the grass when I didn't even see them and surrender. Just when I was in, in my jeep with nothing but uh, me and a couple of soldiers. He could have shot any one of us. How many of your friends were with you at the Battle of the Bulge? My friends? The people you knew. Well, the whole battalion. But no, I'm talking about friends that you had known prior to going into the army. None. None. There was nobody in my battalion that I'd known before the, I went in. I mentioned to Tommy, uh, he was aboard the uh, destroyer. He yeah. was providing service to the Yorktown. Right. And uh, I was telling him that while he was aboard the Yorktown, I mean, aboard the destroyer, Ernest Davis was aboard the Yorktown. And there were two Carter Countyans involved in that, uh, both in the Battle of Midway, but others, but also at the sinking of the Yorktown. Well, he, well the Yorktown didn't sink then. The Yorktown was struck, but, it was struck. but survived, and she sunk. Was it Midway she sunk? She sunk she shortly after sunk. Midway. She sank at Midway. Right after. That's right. It was, uh, well, well, Ernest wasn't born there at Midway. Yes, he was. She got no, he was overboard. He had got he had got blown over. He came back aboard. He was back aboard when he was blown off of her twice. Was it twice? Mm -hmm. She she got hit in the Battle of the Coral Sea. That's that's right. And, that's right. And then well, Ernest they patched her up and she went on to Midway. Well, I, uh, Ernest told me I thought that, well maybe I'm wrong. But Ernest was the gunnery officer aboard the Midway, that's and he's right. and he's he tells the story that it was because of him that she she got injured, wounded, uh, prior to the sinking because he said he shot down the, uh, the dive bomber, even if the, he, he said he could tell the bomb was going to miss the ship, but he ordered the dive bomber shot down and that's what hit the elevator and started the whole chain of events. So he, he that's so, so his story goes. He well, tells a great story that um, when he was in Pearl Harbor, they were changing out the uh, 20s, 20 millimeters, I'm putting 40 millimeters. It was before, before Midway. Before Midway, while they were in Mid, while they were in Pearl Harbor. That just about a week or so. Was all right, there. exactly. And uh, he said that they were they had ordered 40 millimeters to be re, to replace all the 20s. That was that was the Swedish gun. The 40 was. And we, we used it too. And he said that uh, he wouldn't let any of the 20s leave the ship. Wouldn't let what? He wouldn't let, he, he, they were taking on the 40 millimeters. Um, he kept the 20s too. He kept the 20s on. Yeah. And he was asked about it afterwards when they were writing the Battle of, uh, Battle of Midway. Um, the author asked him, he said, why did you keep the, why did you not let the 20s leave the ship? His response was, he figured if he put enough lead in the air, a plane would fly into it. <laughs> well, that's right. All right. You went to the World War II Memorial, and you came home, and you were talking about it earlier. Of that trip, what was the most impressive part? The return home, seeing all those people that had apparently remembered the war and remembered us. Must have been 2,000 of them. Every bit. And they were there, welcomed us back. Oh, there we were, something. He, he, uh, Call us heroes, even though we, we were probably weren't. But we ever, well, I won't say that. But uh, you never got a welcome home like that when you came home following the war. Well, of course not. The only person that welcomed me home was my daddy. He picked me up before it Bragg. Wow. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. Well, Walter, I'll be Lockwood. You got. You inquired about things that happened a long time ago. Ancient history. No, sir. No, sir. That's not ancient. And it's important. The uh, war, the war of World War II, 
It was a very unusual time. If you remember, we had four horrible people that had come on this earth that caused that war. You had Hitler and Mussolini. You had Tito, that's right. He was Tito, yep. And him, and the fourth character, well, I was Stalin. All four of these characters killed with this earth at one time. It was the work of the devil. It was truly the work of the devil. And these four people had absolutely no regard for human life. None whatsoever. And we find nothing when we were going through France. I heard a wood story where there had been a German soldier killed by somebody in the underground, French underground. And the next day, the punishment of that town for that event, which the town had no way to prevent, they called out every male person in that town from 12 years up. They counted off to 10, every 10th person. Every 10th person was called out, lined up and shot. Little boys, 12 years old, right on up. Well, that's the way they, that's the way they lived. That's the way they punished them. That was the German army. Those Germans had been taught, convinced that the death of an enemy was okay. We saw the, the gas chambers where they killed the Jews. Six million of them, as I recall. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we went through in seeing that kind of stuff. They were the kind of people we dealt with. And uh, as we met them, and, they, and they, they killed our prisoners too. Some Americans were taken were killed. And we knew that. And it, 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 it remained us wanting to kill them. It, but we later learned not to not because we had respect for their life, but we knew we killed them, they had nothing to lose, they wouldn't surrender. So you don't, you don't kill an enemy. If you do, he won't surrender. And we, we had, a, it, one of the hardest things we had to do with our troops was keep them from killing the enemy prisoners. They wanted to do it. The hatred was so great and we finally convinced them not to do it. But it wasn't easy. That's one of our biggest problems. I know uh, I saw it happen, and especially with you, to, to, you take a replacement that hit you. For the next month, after he'd been there about a month, you could you could turn him over to March Printer's back. He'd kill him. He was the one. His hatred was so great. He didn't understand that you can't do that. It wasn't so much the idea of protecting him, it was a matter of good, good sense. Don't kill the prisoner. And the Germans, after they realized we wouldn't kill him, they, that's when we began to get surrenders. <clears throat> you, one thing that people don't understand, and I, I can appreciate this, <clears throat> is the experience. The experience. The well, it's the greatest thing. experience of our lives. I've come home. I have tried a thousand lawsuits. Some, some important, some belittle, some big. None of them. Nothing like that compares with my action in the war. That nothing is great. Tommy tell you the same thing. That's the biggest experience. There's no way you, well, especially if you were an officer and had commander troops, their life was your responsibility. Every officer that didn't think of his, of his, of his people that way wasn't a good officer. Mm -hmm. You saw that he was fed. You saw that he was clothed, looked after you. You saw that he was treated if he was sick. I remember had some of the things that happened. Well, let me tell you another story. 
I was moving one time. John Atten was with me. I, I can't remember just where it was. And it was it was cold though. I remember this. It was that part of the year. It was winter time. In the jeep, and as we were moving up, this woman came out of the woods, all in black with her head all tied up, and she was obviously a, a displaced person, either a Pole or a Russian. And uh, she came and waved us down, and she started talking, very excitedly talking. And of course, I couldn't understand the words she said. But John sat next to me, talked to her. And he turned to me and said, she says that there's a woman over that barn having a, a baby that's in serious trouble, and she wants to know we can help her. I said, how the hell can we help her? Well, he I said, well, it was, so we rode over to the barn, and I saw this woman laying on some hay, moaning and groaning. There were some other women in there had built a fire inside the barn, trying to boil some water. But this woman was just in intense agony. Well, we had a battalion uh, surgeon at that time named Kaler. We later got rid of him. But he was an obstetrician from Pets, from. Uh, some town in Pennsylvania, I forget where. Anyway, and he wasn't worth a dinner to us. So I got on the radio, called back, got patched through to Taylor, I mean to Kaler. I come on up here, bring your medical section with you. Come on, you know, we need you in a hurry. Well, he came, here he came. He thought we'd been to firefight or something. So here he came. You know, I said, I finally found a patient in Europe you're fit to treat. There's only one problem. Come on here. And he was really, we left him looking after that poor woman. Well, we went on, I guess we went 40 miles further before we stopped. And uh, I got, about midnight, we were moving out and I was going to move again the next day and I knew that I was going to run into some action. I was afraid, so I wanted to get a better medical section to go with me. So I went back where he was, medical section was this little town we had. And he was just coming in. He said, oh, well, I delivered him. It was a breech birth, he said. That's why she was having trouble. He said, I delivered him. It was a little boy that he said, and they named him after me. Oh, great, great. And so that's all I know about it. But he, he delivered the baby. <laughs> and they were some of the things that we did. I don't know how many other people have <laughs> None. None. But but anyway, that's but it may have. We did a lot of things for those people. We really did. We had another occasion, as I think about it. We were running down the road, the shell popped down the right about a hundred yards ahead of me hit the road, so I realized we had an observation. It was just a, it was just me. I was running reconnaissance. Colonel was with me. That's right. Tank commander was with me on this trip. We put the damn jeep in a concrete building and uh, had just had the antenna stepped out. And I got on the radio and I called one of our planes that were in there. I fly up here, fly low, and see what it is firing. He said it's a German horse-drawn artillery battalion. But at that time. Germany was run out of fuel, and the artillery has been pulled by horses, most instances. I said, well, and he gave me the coordinates from where it was. This is a battalion. So I called one of our batteries that were moving up, and they came in, and we put them in this position. And uh, I called them, it was a battery test one. I explained to you what battery test one was like, getting in there fast. Right. And they came in, oh, it was my old battery. Oh, Joe Johnson was commanding. He threw that battery there, nothing flat, and we started firing. Well, the way this position was, there was a hill right in front of it. The Germans had no observation. We had the observation through the plane, and the plane directed the fire, and we outshot that battalion. And uh, when we did, I got a bunch of the uh, Cannoneers, got them in a truck, and we rolled on up there. And when we got there, of course, there were a lot of German wounded, but uh, 
these poles, these slaves that they had captured that had brought that were escaped now from the Germans, but they were starving to death. And they had moved over. We had killed some of the horses, and they had moved over and built fires, and we cut stakes off the horses and cooking them. And there was a pretty white horse there. I must belong to the probably battalion commander. I got him, full saddles and all, even with a saber on him. And uh, I crawled aboard the horse. It just, and the horse was just as I just, I mean, it was, it was content for me to ride him as he could be. Anyway, I rode the horse back. And I got back, the colonel was standing out in the middle of the road, and I was riding that horse back. And I remember he said, who in the hell do you think you are, George Patton? <laughs> I never forget that. That was the only thing I saw in Germany that I wanted to keep. But I didn't bring you home, Tommy. Huh? I didn't bring that horse home. <laughs> yeah, you Claude, thank you very much for this. Okay. This is fantastic. Oh, what it's all over. When I got on the train in L.A., coming home, I had enough points to get out. And I was waiting for the train in L.A., and remember those Mickey Mouse cartoons you used to see on the movie that put so many people in the house that the, the, bounce, that the sides would bulge out mm -hmm. and the top would come up, you know? Well, that's the way that damn train was. That's you behind there the most people. Anyway, had that porter, you know, that, you know that step that they put down right on the, on the train. train. He said, there's no room on there, you can't. I said, buddy, you're not big enough to keep me off of that damn train if she leaves here. <laughs> I, have. You know, I was married and hadn't been home in three years. Anyway, he threw that that step up and I was right behind. He went up there and sat on that damn thing between those passenger cars all that night and the next day. Me and another sailor at, on the way to Chicago. Told him it would take two nights and two days or something like that. But and, um, Tommy, you were... Do you want to come home? You were as anxious as we all. Everybody wanted to do that. Everybody what? Wanted to get home. Damn right. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we were in. We were in the Germany, of course. We we got we got our orders. We had to go to the La Havre. That was a <clears> shipping <throat> point out of Paris, out of France. And they had what they called caps there. They were all named after cigarettes. <clears throat> Camp Cabell, Camp Wig. We stayed in Camp Wig until they had a ship that would take us home. And they had these old victory ships, and they had, uh, I guess that's what it was. Anyway, I was on that ship. There were about 40 or 50 company grade officers on there, with maybe 400. Uh, uh, they had lower ranks, and uh, they had a room like this, and the biggest drink that those boys wanted was milk. Yeah. I never saw them. They were starving for milk, and they were all sitting there drinking milk, but I never did like milk. Anyway, one of them started telling them about a miracle that happened to him that saved his life. How he. The good Lord spoke to him, told him to move, and the shell hit where he was. Anyway, things like that. Every man, every one of those combat officers had a story like that, where something they call a miracle saved their life. Everybody in that room. That was, that was remarkable. I wish I'd taped that, some of those stories were absolutely wonderful. That's what you really need.